All right, today we're going to talk about the Renaissance, the period in Europe from 1300 to 1600. So to recap where we left off with our last unit, the major institutions of medieval Europe, the feudalism, the church, and chivalry, started to decline in the middle of the 15th century. And about that time, we see a change in European society, starting in Italy, which historians call this time period of the Renaissance. So the word Renaissance comes from a Latin phrase that means to be born again. And that term came about because it was seen as a revival of uh, the art, learning, and culture that was lost in the Middle Ages. Remember that uh, before the Middle Ages, Europe had Rome and before that, Greece. And a lot of people in Italy especially uh, during this time period considered that to sort of be the heart and the, the height of European civilization. So they started to try and turn culture back towards that era. And we see other social, economic, and political changes too that make historians look at the Renaissance as the start of the modern period. Some of the major institutions you think about today, secular society, nation states, they started during the Renaissance. Eventually you see the Renaissance spread to most of Europe, but it's gonna start in Italy, and there's a number of reasons for that. For one, if you'll recall, in the 14th century, the plague swept through Europe, uh, killing upwards of half of Europe's population. And Italy was also hit hard by the plague, but not as bad as other places. Um, and Italy managed to maintain a number of large cities, like Florence, Rome, and Venice. And those cities maintained a lot of wealth, mostly through trade. And because these cities were so large, and they were net, uh, sort of centers of trade, um, they became places where ideas were exchanged. And we'll see that the Renaissance being a period of ideas, that becomes very important. Uh, another important aspect of Italy was that it maintained a large merchant population. Most of the Middle Ages, Europe didn't have a lot of merchants. But Italy was really the heart of Mediterranean trade. So a lot of the wealthiest families in Europe were in Italy. And starting around the 1300s, a lot of those merchant families will start to turn to art to show their power and wealth. Um, probably the most famous of these was the Medici. The Medici were a family from Florence, and they really kind of started the Florentine banking guild. Um, they became so powerful that really across all of Europe, uh, the florin, the currency used in Florence, was used by um, merchants and monarchs alike. Um, and we'll see that they had a very large impact on art and culture in the Renaissance. And then finally, remember that Rome was in Italy. And when people are looking back on the classical heritage of ancient Greece and Rome, they're literally looking around them. Um, as a lot of building products projects started in Italy during the, uh, the 14th century, they kind of came across a lot of the ruins that had been lost. They found ancient statues and other works of art from classical Greece and Rome. And that kind of inspired them to look past what had happened really over the last thousand years in Europe back to this ancient time period. Probably the most famous aspect of the Renaissance is its art. And that's because there was a flourishing of art, uh, especially in Italy, during this time. If you think about what happened in the 14th century, as the plague swept through Europe, um, a lot of the skilled craftsmen were killed. And in the Middle Ages, craftsmen weren't as highly valued as we might think of as artists today. Uh, they're essentially seen as skilled laborers, um, not somebody who should be famous necessarily. Um, often painters were just paid in how much paint they used, um, sculptors on how large their sculptures were, not necessarily the skill involved in them. It's not to say the Middle Ages didn't have its own um, set of art and art movements, it certainly did, um, but the value of that work is going to rise during this time period. One of the big reasons was that the Black Death killed so many of these craftsmen. And you just think about supply and demand. Um, now, though, since there's fewer craftsmen, they can charge more for their work because they're in more demand. Um, and so the value of their labor went up. And if they're going to go and try and find out where they can get paid the best, they're going to go to Italy because of the wealth of these Italian merchants and these trade cities. Um, you see not only rich merchants and their families, but also the Catholic Church end up spending a lot of money on art. And they become what we call patrons of the arts. Um, a patron is a financial supporter to an artist. You know, artists like to make money, but they also like to eat. 
and uh, have housing. And to get all that, they need somebody to pay them. And that's what a patron does. Now, because the Renaissance was a period of ideas, it's important to focus on and understand what those values and those intellectual ideas were. And if you think about the Renaissance, there's really four main values that you're going to see throughout the period. And that's humanism, individualism, secularism, and rationalism. Humanism was a particular school of philosophy in Italy uh, that started in the 14th century that really focused on human potential and achievements. And we say that they're really talking about ancient Greece and Rome. Um, remember that in the Middle Ages, really up until, say, the high Middle Ages in the 11th century, there wasn't a whole lot of major cities, construction projects. Um, most people were still illiterate. And as we moved in the 14th century, people started to look back and say, OK, well, what makes a good society? And when they looked back to ancient Greece and Rome, they thought, OK, this is a good society. So we need to try and make ours more like that. Um, now, remember in the late Middle Ages, there really was an intellectual culture in Europe. There was the philosophy of scholasticism, which emphasized the church's teaching and how to apply logic and reason to faith and belief. But humanism um, rejected a lot of the ideas of medieval culture. Um, and in particular, they're going to be willing, at least more willing, to question church's history and church teaching. Now, don't misunderstand that and think that they rejected the church, because we'll see that the Renaissance is also a time um, of religion, and the church almost had a revival of its power. But the way that's approached and understood changes with humanism being this important philosophical school in Europe. In addition to humanism, there's more focus on individualism, um, looking at individuals and what they should do rather than what society should do. Remember, in the Middle Ages, most people thought that society was basically divided into three different parts, those who fight, those who pray, and those who work. And those are the basic classes of the Middle Ages. And that's not to say the social uh, structure changed much, but the idea of what people should do, especially in the upper class, did change. Um, for men, there was this idea that someone should be a universal man, or as you might say today, a Renaissance man. Somebody who has not just mastered one or two areas of study, but many areas of study, who's good at everything. Um, a good Renaissance man or a courtier should be able to fight and paint and dance and read and write Latin, uh, play music, appreciate art. Uh, they're expected to sort of be good at all aspects of life. Um, women, for their part, uh, had different expectations, but similar in some ways. A Renaissance woman was expected to be able to appreciate and, and uh, inspire art, but not necessarily be uh, creators of art or be involved in politics or intellectual discussion. And there certainly will be some women who break that mold, but they were more the outliers, and these are more the expectations of that society. Renaissance society was also more secular. We mentioned how uh, in the Middle Ages there was a conflict between the secular and religious leaders. And secularism really focuses on, um, rather than the afterlife, on the here and the now. Remember, in the Middle Ages, um, as important as the church was, most people sort of viewed heaven as their ultimate goal. And therefore, worldly pleasure was abandoned um, in favor of faith. So people didn't necessarily dress richly or eat richly or try to create great art that wasn't strictly religious. Um, but you start to see a, a move from that as we get into the 14th century. Part of that was because Italy was really wealthy. They had the money to afford um, more food, foreign goods, clothing, music, art. And also after the Black Death, a lot of people started to consider that since life is short, it should be appreciated more. Um, now, don't misunderstand that to think that it was a rejection of religion. Again, society in the Renaissance was very religious, but they're more secular in their religion, um, rather than necessarily people focused on, say, praying and fasting for long periods of time. Instead, they might appreciate their faith by appreciating great art, or uh, building bigger churches, or um, places that they considered to be more glorious to God. Um, and especially the Catholic Church became a very important patron of the arts. Um, we'll see one Pope Julius II tore down the ancient basilica in Rome of St. Peter's 
and build a brand new one that was inspired by classical Greek and Roman works. So it's not necessarily a rejection of religion, but rather appreciating your worldly life as well as religion. And then finally, we have the value of rationalism. Rationalism is the embrace of science and logic. Um, remember that during the ancient Greek period, especially the Hellenistic times, um, there were a lot of philosophers and thinkers and scientists, people like Aristotle, Plato, Socrates. Um, and as people rediscover those works, they really try to go back and embrace those. Um, early in the Middle Ages, you didn't see that much. Plato, Aristotle, and other Greek thinkers were seen as just pagan, and so their works weren't appreciated. Now, that did change in the later Middle Ages, especially under people like Thomas Aquinas, who uh, took Aristotle's ideas and tried to apply them to faith. Um, but now you see even more of an embrace of the scientific thinking. Uh, and sometimes that, was, that would be more important than religious belief. Again, not a rejection of religion, but we will see later on that the church is more directly criticized than it was in the Middle Ages. Um, you also see critical thinking about nature and history. People start to look for patterns and ideas um, in the natural world, which we would think of as science, and in history. Really the first ideas of how we should divide history into different time periods came from the Renaissance. So we know the Renaissance had a lot of art, uh, and we know they had a lot of these values. So where do they come together? I want to kind of show you an example of how you can look for Renaissance values and techniques in art. So here's a famous Renaissance work, Raphael Sanzio's The School of Athens. To kind of give you an introduction, um, Raphael was hired by uh, one of the Renaissance popes to paint this large mural in his new palace. Um, and Raphael, rather than choosing a religious theme, chose to look at the ancient philosophers in Greece and Rome. You see in the middle here, we have Plato and Aristotle arguing, and then around them, they're surrounded by different thinkers of um, the ancient world. Some of these are philosophers, some are mathematicians, some are geographers or inventors, um, and really he pulled not only from the classical Greek and Roman world, but we can see over here an Arab scholar, Ibn Rashid. Um, we have um, really a, a whole selection from across the classical world. And what I want to do is show you where you can find some of those Renaissance values and themes in this piece of art. So let's start with the setting. Uh, this, as you can see, is Plato's Academy. This is an ancient Greek institution. So Raphael is really embracing that idea of humanism, looking back on the classical Greek and Roman world for inspiration for his time. Also one thing you'll notice is that there's really nothing Christian in this. Now most art in the Middle Ages was uh, either related to some of the heroes of chivalry or to the church. But here we have an ancient Greek, which would be considered a pagan setting, uh, totally removed from Christianity. And if you look at the setting, people are richly dressed, there's great statues everywhere. It really looks at the secular world rather than the religious one. In the corner, we can see a number of scholars. Um, at the bottom here, you have uh, Eratosthenes holding a globe which uh, shows his uh, observations of the world. Uh, you have at the bottom uh, Euclid drawing some triangles. Uh, you have a number of other thinkers from the classical Greek and Roman world. So really they're, they're not just um, religious figures or heroes. They're what he called natural philosophers, mathematicians, astronomers, thinkers, uh, people who would be considered rationalists. So here we can see rationalism. There's a couple of other interesting features here. Uh, one thing that Raphael did was take some of his heroes from the time and put them into the painting. So for example, on the right here, you can actually see uh, Raphael himself. He drew a little self-portrait. Um, down in the center, um, there's an uh, artist there. Um, and the model he used was Michelangelo, another famous artist. Uh, in the center, the model he used for Plato was Leonardo da Vinci. So he's really looking at individual figures, um, people who would be considered great or universal thinkers of their time. So hopefully I've given you a good introduction to why the Renaissance started and some of its values. And so you're going to start looking at individual pieces of art and trying to find those values in them.